Okay, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Um, happy Wednesday. I hope uh, you're recovering nicely from the exam uh, the last two days. And we're really approaching the end of the semester. So uh, what I was hoping to do these last couple lectures is, you know, take some of this fairly abstract um, physics that we've learned over the last couple of, of lectures and apply it to um, some real world systems and hopefully have some fun with it along the way. Uh, it's early in the morning and I am prone to, you know, making mistakes with my audio or video. So I'd appreciate if anybody out there could just say hello or, uh, you know, type something in the chat and just let me know that you guys can, can see my screen and can hear my voice, that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, Amelia, thank you. Good morning to you, too. Um, so where were we last time? Uh, good morning. Good morning, Catherine. Good morning, Jacqueline. Thank you very much. Um, last time we were talking about RC circuits, and we, we saw this, uh, you know, it's a simple circuit, but we're going to see that this is actually pretty, pretty cool. It actually pops up a lot of times in technology and in biological systems, um, in, in anything that has a time dependence. Can can some sometimes be modeled with with an RC simple behavior. So we have a resistor, we have a capacitor, we have a switch. We close that switch, and um, and what happens? Well, we have this unnatural imbalance of charge on the the top and bottom plate of the capacitor, and nature wants to wants to fix that. So it's going to this 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 charge separation creates a current flow and that current is gonna rush off the capacitor plate through the resistor and balance itself. And what we'll find is that behavior is, um, I have so many windows open right now, I can't even see what I'm doing, um, is gonna be exponential in nature. So we saw that that's gonna be governed by a simple exponential, the current um, uh, flowing through that resistor and the uh, voltage across that, uh, across that um what are, you, what are you doing come on no no you can't no go ahead out i'm teaching i'm gonna talk to you later come on i don't have your computer it's upstairs no it's not your computer okay i'm sorry i don't have it please all right excuse me um so we have this voltage um across the resistor it's it starts at some maximum value it decays with time with this typical exponential behavior and the time constant of this system is going to be given just by the, the combination of resistance and um, capacitance. So the, the, the takeaway kind of rule of thumb of this uh, system is the time constant, like I said, it governs the time dependence. What good is that? Well, after one time constant, you calculate this, this is going to come out as some number of seconds. After one time constant, this is going to have fallen to about 37% of its original. So from some maximum, after one time constant, you're going to be down to 37%. Five time constants tells you when this has fallen to less than 1%. And that's typically where people would say, okay, most of the action is done. The transient behavior of this system is over. And it, it now has kind of settled into to where it's going to be. So that's, you know, those are the two kind of things. I don't want you to memorize this, but you can always pump, punch them into your calculator. And um, this is the kind of thing that a time constant is good for. So if it's, you know, it has this exponential change with time. Um, one and five time constants are a good thing to have in, in your mind for, for, for when, you know, things are changing. The other system that we looked at was instead of discharging a capacitor, what would it take to charge a capacitor? And um, here we have a battery with a, a, an EMF. Again, sorry, it's a weird word. I didn't invent it, but it, we're stuck with it. It's just another way of saying a potential difference. But we might want to differentiate sometimes between the potential difference provided by the battery and the potential difference across some circuit element, like, for example, this capacitor or this resistor. And what we found last time was the, you close this switch, what's going to happen? A current's going to flow off of that battery, but it will very quickly slam into that capacitor and the charge will build up. The char the, you'll, you'll, find your, you'll hit your equilibrium situation and then that current will 
stop. So again, you have this exponential die off of the current that, that comes, even though this is a different, different circuit, has the exact same formula and the exact same time constant. Um, so that's, that's the, the, the current is exactly the same. The potential difference across this capacitor, we have, a, we have a, a slightly different situation here. I remind you that this, again, we have the time constant tau governing the time dependence, but instead of a drop off of the voltage, what we're gonna have is an increase. So in the beginning, before this switch is closed, we have a potential difference across this capacitor of zero. And as, as time increases, that potential grows in this, uh, in this functional way. So if you look at this at very large T, E to the negative large number is very, very small. This goes to zero. So we basically wind up with delta V equals epsilon, or the potential across the capacitor is equal to the potential across the battery if we get to long enough time. What does long enough time mean? Well, five time constants or so, you're gonna be basically there within 1%. Okay, so that's, you know, that's, that's in a nutshell what we did. That was the last thing that we talked about um, that was not on the exam, so I don't know how well you paid attention to it last time, but hopefully this, this kind of five-minute review gets you back on track with this. Today what we're going to do is try to take a look at electricity in the nervous system. Our goal is to model a, a, a simple nerve cell as an RC circuit. For those of you reading along at home, I'm, I'm trying to take the, the highlights, the, the interesting things, at least the things that I like um, from the textbook in sections 21.2 and 23.8. I'm gonna be talking a lot today as normal. I, you know, it's a lecture, I have to lecture. Um, if I ever start getting too, too fast or I just leave you in the dust, don't hesitate to, to throw up that go slow or send me a chat and, and uh, ask a question, slow me down. Make sure that we're all on the same pace here, or on a good pace. Okay, so here's our goal. I hope to get here by the end of the end of the lecture, is we have a cell. I'm, I'm zoomed in on this, so what we're supposed to be seeing here is a cell membrane. We have some goop on the outside of the cell. We have some goop on the inside of the cell. I'm not a biologist, so I don't know what it's actually called, but it's probably pretty goopy. Um, so we have this, this, this stuff. And then we have this membrane separating it. What I want to see is if we can model this membrane as a resistor or a, and a capacitor and, and see if we can deduce what those properties of a, of a typical membrane would be. Okay, because then we have an RC circuit and we know what an RC circuit will do. Okay, so I'm going to give a little bit of a, you know, a, a brief segue into history here. So if we go back, this, this connection between biological processes and electricity or potential differences and and living living things is nothing new it's nothing mysterious it's it's well it is kind of mysterious but it's it's something that's been known for a long time um, and it, it traces back as far as I know to Luigi Gal, Galvani um, who in the late 1700s was working at the University of Bologna in what's now Italy I think it would have been the papal states at the time but uh, Bologna was a, you know, a, um, 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 an esteemed college back then. It's an esteemed college back uh, now. And what, what uh, Galvani found was he was, uh, he was a man of many talents. He was a physicist. He was a philosopher. He was a biologist. So what he was doing was he was looking at um, dissecting frogs and poor little creatures. Um, what he found was just quite by accident was if he was dissecting a frog and he was in a, a, a region when say his scalpel or his instrument got a static charge on it. Okay. He's walking around in his socks or something on a rug a carpet floor and he gets a, he gets a, a, a shock. What he found was that could induce there's, there's, um, there's Mr. Galvani right there. Um, what he found was that he could induce, muscular movement in these deceased frogs. They were long dead, but the, these electrical, uh, this application of electricity would trigger muscle spasms in the sciatic nerve of these frogs. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you here, for the, it's early in the morning and it's a little bit gross. I assume you, know, you guys are 
life science majors, you've dissected a frog at some point in your life. But what I'm going to show here is a is a, a movie of a dissected frog. So if you want to turn away or just tune out, now's the time. It's only going to be 30 seconds, but I'm going to show you what Galvani found in the 1700s. So this is called, I don't, you know, I guess kind of jokingly the frog zombie experiment. But we have a poor little frog here. I love frogs. I'm building a frog pond in my backyard, so I don't advocate you doing this. But this is all in the name of science. So we have a frog cadaver that's clearly a deceased frog. He has shuffed the mortal coil. And someone is applying electrodes across the sciatic nerve here. You can see that those frog legs are, are firing as if this poor guy is still alive. And this is what Galvani first noticed when, you know, back in the 1700s. And it got his mind thinking that, hey, there's some critical role that electricity and um, electrical potential um, plays in biological processes. Well, Galvani in the late 1700s didn't have the understanding of electricity that we, we have today, but he made this first interesting connection between um, these electrical, these new electrical phenomenon and um, and um, you know living creatures. So this percolated you know quite quickly into the popular culture. And I, you know, I hope that at some point in your life you've seen a movie about Frankenstein or you've read the book or whatever. You guys uh, aren't aren't English majors or literature majors, but this is kind of a kind of a big one. Um, Frankenstein was written by Mary Shelley in in 1816, and or probably 1821, something like that. But her husband was Percy Shelley, who was a famous uh, poet, and she was a great writer on her own on her own. Um, and the, her, Percy Shelley, and Lord Byron, who's one of the most famous um, poets, were sitting around talking about Galvani's um, experiments. And very shortly after that, Mary Shelley had this, you know, um, spout of inspiration, and she wrote this this novel, Frankenstein, based on you know these these early weird experiments by by Galvani. So this this whole thing, you know, is 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 a well known phenomenon. It's 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 um, it's well documented. You can you can think of it back in the old days, or you can think about today. If you go on the internet, and I don't recommend you go on the internet because it's a terrible place, but you can find all kinds of weird things. And you can find, you know, abdominal muscle um, stimulators. So what we got here is someone's taking electrodes, applying them to their, to their abdomen. And um, we'll see what happens here in a moment. Electrode pads are placed on the skin over the muscle to be stimulated. I hope you can hear my audio. If not, please uh, please let me know in the chat. We're going to start firing these these electrodes in a moment here, just applying a potential difference. The greatest benefit to running any program is achieved by contracting as much as possible. So we have a question from the audience uh, from Cassandra. Aren't those machines sometimes used to simulate labor pains in men? And I didn't know that, but it's a great idea. I think that might be, it looks horrible. It looks like a, a torture to me. And um, I, think, I think you must be right, Cassandra, because that looks like it's quite painful. Here's another guy that, that tried out one of these things. This one looks like a cheaper version that maybe is a little bit less controlled. Um, and you see this guy trying out this abdomen stimulator. Now it's doing like a steady beat. It's difficult for you to witness this clearly. Okay, now you can see it a little more. Oh my god! I don't know anything about nutrition. I don't know anything about science, but something big is happening right now. Oh my Jesus! Yeah, look, you can see that definitely. Look at it. Oh. So with that, <laughs> with that in mind, Cassandra, I think yes, these are used to stimulate labor pains in men. I think that it looks like a very accurate way of describing what this device does. I am not advocating you go out. Go do some actual crunches. Don't I, I don't advocate buying this thing. It looks like a torture device. Um, Troy says they are also used in athletic training to stimulate healing for in injuries. It works pretty well. Really, Troy? Okay. So, um, okay, you're right. The internet is a terrible place, says Francis. Yes, and you can find all kinds of terrible things like physics videos from Carl Slifer on the internet. I don't recommend you ever go on there. Um, Troy Police says, not necessarily on the stomach, but 
for you know for healing of injuries. Interesting to know. Okay. Um, so this is you know this is a, this is a phenomenon. It is what it is. Our bodies are electrical in nature, um, and and they respond to electricity. They run on electricity. They have all kinds of interesting things. Here's a picture of you know Frankenstein making his monster, reanimating him the same way that that poor little frog was was reanimated. Um, so what we're going to do is you know it's a super complex system. Your body. What I would like to to start with is some understanding of you know, how our basic unit, a cell, responds to electricity. And what we're going to try to do is model a cell with a, um, as an RC circuit. So we'll start with, you know, we talked about this a little bit. I hope, I think um, Dawn in one of the group works talked about uh, the cell membrane can, can be modeled as a capacitor. And this is all true. I want to make this a little bit more quantitative today. So we have uh, a model of a cell. This is my poorly drawn cell. It's supposed to be, you know, a membrane. There's the goop of, uh, you know, of your body outside here. There's, there's a goop of the cell inside. And that's about the level of my knowledge of the biology of a cell is there's goop on the inside and goop on the outside. And there's a cell membrane separate them, separating them. If there's more details there, I, I leave that to you guys to figure out um, because you're going to be life science, you know, you're going to be applying this stuff. But the, the net result is that we get a potential difference. And I know about potential differences. So a potential difference um, from the inside to the outside of that cell, and the typical value is something like 70 millivolts. Remember the absolute value of potential never really matters. It is um, differences that are important. So what we have is we have a potential difference across this cell membrane. And we're gonna take that and see what we can learn about that. How does this happen? Again, my bio biology background is pretty basic. I, you know, I took biology in, in college and that was many moons ago. Um, but basically what's happening here, I think, is we have this system that allows the passage of sodium and potassium ions. And it's called, you know, technically a sodium potassium, potassium ion pump. And let me see if I can find a little graphic of this. Basically, what you know, what what's happening here is in the the end product, your, how your cell accomplishes it is is a little bit tricky, but you wind up with a net um, a, a net imbalance of positive ions. So you wind up with more positive ions, sodium ions, on the outside of the cell than on the inside of the cell, and that's something nature doesn't want, right? It doesn't if 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 all things are equal, it's just going to be this homogeneous distribution of positive charges. You've done something artificial. Your your cell has done something artificial to separate these. Um, the actual technical term for this is a sodium potassium exchange pump. If you want to, you know, dig into the details of this, what's it doing? It's kicking sodium ions out and it's kicking uh, potassium ions in, and in the in the process, making a net imbalance of charge. We know about that because once we have a net imbalance of charge, we've created a potential difference. So I think I have something here, a little graphic that I can share with you. So this is a super simple model. Let's say we have, you know, we have these little pump gates that your, your cell can open and close and, you know, by, by chemical means. And with this, we can create, you know, some imbalance by judiciously opening and closing these, these gates uh, of, you know, how many ions are going to be inside or outside of your cell. The process of that, I honestly don't quite understand because I'm not a biologist. Maybe you guys have a better understanding of that from, from your own experience. But the end result I understand, which is, okay, we got more positive charge out here than we have in here, and that's going to create a potential difference. Let me turn this down because it just sends my CPU, CPU spinning. Um, Again, as you know, I invite questions as we're talking about this. This is something that maybe some of you guys have some experience with. I really appreciate when you do kind of chime in, so, so feel free to do so. What we have here is, you know, a separation of charge. We get a potential difference across that cell membrane by doing that. So we have the interior goop, we have the exterior goop, and then we have this very thin cell membrane separating them. Um, so the net result in the end typically is something like we have 10 times more positive ions on the outside than, than the inside. And that's going to create this, this potential difference of, you know, there's nothing magical about this number, but 
a rough order of magnitude number would be something like 70 millivolts, uh, more positive on the outside than on the inside. Okay, so, and then you could, you know, you can measure the thickness of these cell membranes. They're very small, but they're about seven nanometers. So we have this, we have this thing, this, this layer of something, this cell membrane, that's about seven nanometers thick and is 70 millivolts with a, a potential of 70 millivolts across it. Go back a couple of lectures, we talked about, about this a separation of charge with a potential difference across it. That looks a lot like um, a parallel plate capacitor. Now this is not perfect, but it's, it's a pretty good model. And if you go back the formula we had to figure out what the electric field across that um, potential difference, is given by this formula. So the electric field is just the potential difference divided by the distance. So we've got our 70 millivolts, we've got our seven nanometers, and 70 millivolts is a 10 to the minus three type guy, and uh, nanometers is a 10 to the minus nine type girl, and you, you subtract, you divide those two, and we get something 10 to the seven volts per meter, which is the units of electric field. 10 to the seven is uh, 10 million volts per meter. This is a tremendous amount of, of potential or a tremendous amount of, of uh, elect, I'm sorry, it's not potential of electric field. I have to be, it's, it's potential per meter, volts per meter. So this is greater than, than you would find, um, you know, what's necessary to, to, to arc electricity across um, a gap, an air gap in space. So you need a pretty large potential to do that. Uh, or a pre I keep mixing up the words, I'm sorry, a pretty large electric field to do that. And this humble little cell is creating this um, very large electric field across that cell membrane. Okay, so I'm gonna slow down just for a moment here, let you guys catch up, um, ask any questions that you want. Um, I'll set up the next slide here, but I don't wanna just jam this all down your throat. I wanna take... Okay, great question from Francis. Why is the potential so large if the cell is so small? That just seems like a lot for such a small cell. Yep, it really does. It really, really does. Um, I think what we got here, um, Francis, is the power of, you know, algebra is, is helping us here. That D, because of the charge separation, imagine, imagine um, you know, if we go back to our simple model of a couple, couple days ago or a week ago, we had a parallel plate capacitor. The closer that I make the parallel plate capacitor together, the larger that electric field would be inside. If you remember, um, so so what we're what we're seeing here is that division by d would um, just kind of amplifies that. Okay, so I hope that I, I agree with you. It seems absurdly large. It seems crazily large, um, but I think the 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 governing factor here is the the cell membrane is is seven times ten to the minus nine meters that's smaller than the wavelength of visible light. So it's super, super small. It's much smaller than you could ever hope to make um, a macroscopic parallel plate capacitor. But great question. I, I agree with your intuition here. Um, okay, so what we wanna do, or what I wanted to do, maybe you guys wanna do something else. It's a beautiful day outside, but we're almost done. So let's, let's do what I wanna do while we're on this, on this topic, um, is figure out, can we figure out what the resistance of this um, of this cell membrane is. I have another comment in the chat. Uh, Francis says, thanks, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, I, and Taylor says, that makes it so, so small changes in the body have large implications, meaning less energy is expended in biological processes. Okay, I'll take your word for that, Taylor. I don't know anything about, about you know, I, I guess I do. I know about energy consumption, but it seems like this is a an advantageous thing to have is this huge electric field across your cells that that allows these biological um, processes to, to 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 go on. So thank you for the thank you for the comment, Taylor. Um, okay, so membrane resistance. We're going to try to figure out the resistance of this membrane, and um, I've drawn again a cell here, greatly exaggerating that super thin cell membrane um, as this as this uh, thickness here. So the, the typical size of a cell, and this, I don't, you know, I don't know if, if there's a big variation in different types of cells or whatever. This is just some kind of typical number. 
is we'd have this thickness of about seven nanometers. Remember, totally, totally thin. So this is way exaggerated, this thickness. And then compared to a typical cell size, a typical cell diameter would be about five times 10 to the minus five meters. So a radius of about 2.5 times 10 to the minus five meters. So I'm kind of neglecting the difference between uh, this thickness because that seven nanometers is so much smaller than this 10 to the minus five. It just doesn't matter. The size of this is about, so, so basically the size of this thing radius is, is 2.5 times 10 to the minus five. The thickness of this wall greatly exaggerated in my cartoon is seven nanometers. We're trying to figure out what's the resistance of this, um, of this, of this shell, this membrane that's holding the, the cell, this, this, the, the cell goop inside of the cell. So I go back to, you know, um, one of the first things that we, that we played with was, was with resistance. Um, how do we calculate the resistance of, in a wire? We have this, this nice compact formula. You've used it on the exam. You've used it in your homeworks to think about tobacco leaves or something like that. Um, it's a simple model, but it really works very well. What we, what we have to keep in mind is, you know, the difference between resistance, which is measured in ohms, and resistivity, which is measured in ohm meters. The resistivity is a characteristic of the material that you're talking about. The, resist, resist, the resistance is going to be a function of both that material that you're, that you're talking about and the, ge the geometry of whatever the conductor you've made out of that material. To try to make this a little bit less mysterious, if I have a copper, you know, if I have two pieces of copper, I have one in, uh, you know, Durham, New Hampshire, and one in Guatemala, they're both going to have the same resistivity, right? That's typical of copper. But if I take the, the hunk of copper in Durham and I make a large metal bat out of it, and then the, the hunk of copper in Guatemala I make into a thin copper long wire, the, resist, the resistance of those two uh, objects is gonna be much different. The R is gonna be much different. The resistivity is gonna be the same, okay? So again, this resistivity, we have numbers that are characteristic of each material. Cellular membrane group has its own typical number. So the membrane group resistivity is typically something like 3.6 times 10 to the seven ohm meters, okay? Um, the next part of this is we're kind of torturing our model here in the sense that before we were talking about a system that was like a copper, a copper cylinder, and you know, we have some resist resistivity. I can play with the length of it, or I can play with the cross-sectional area of it. What we're thinking about here is something more along the lines of this, where, okay, I have a large cross-sectional area and a small distance that we're going across, like in this membrane. So what I'm asking you to think about is, I take this cell membrane, which is like a beach ball around the cellular goop, and I break it, and then I flatten it out into a sheet, and that sheet, that cross-sectional area, is the area that we're talking about in this um, conductivity formula. That's about as, you know, as subtle as we get today. So if you miss this point, please, please, please throw up your hand, throw up um, a question in the chat, and, and, and we can certainly discuss it more. My drawings, as always, are not very good. So here's a picture from your book. Um, here's a cell. We have the cellular membrane in orange here. We have the inside of the cell in blue, the, the outside of the cell in yellow. And what we're thinking about is taking that beach ball, peeling it off, flattening it out, and that would be this. And then the electrical current would flow through this kind of um, flat pad. And we're trying to find the resistance of that. Okay, so that's just trying to set up what we're trying to do here. Now, I can, I can you know, the resistivity of, of membranes is, is this number. The cross-sectional area, if I take that beach ball and I peel it off and I flatten it out, you know, this is, this is just geometry. I know it might be a while since many of us have thought about geometry or used it in our daily lives, but it's something that you saw a long time ago. The area of a ball or a sphere is um, 
four pi times r squared, where r is the radius. I gave you the radius back here. So we can figure out this cross-sectional area. The L is the distance over which the, we would want the, you know, the, the current to flow. So that's just gonna be our membrane thickness, okay? So simple formula, but it takes a little bit of mental gymnastics to figure out which part of the cell applies to which part of this formula. Um, but if you guys are with me on that and you have no objections to that application, then we're just gonna take these numbers and plug them in. My resistivity, 3.6, 10 to the seven ohm meters. My length, seven nanometers. And my cross-sectional area of this cell, of this beach ball, is four pi r squared. I put this all together, and I, if I'm careful with my units, then my meter meters cancel out with meters squared. Pi doesn't have any units, and I'm left with ohms. I get 3.2 times 10 to the seven ohms. Okay, that's 32 mega ohms. Again, this humble little cell. We we you know I think we all agreed before that we were like, wow, way to go, cell, having such a impressive electric field for just being a cell. This is a pretty impressive um, resistance, I think, for a, a cell membrane. And again, this is, you know, this cell membrane is a very, very good insulator. 32 mega ohms is nothing to sneeze at for this tiny little, tiny little thing. Okay, so um, if there's no questions on that, I'm going to get to the last part of our puzzle, which was we were trying to model this cell. Um, in particular, it's interesting to model a neuron as, a, as an RC circuit. Um, so we're going we're gonna to think about, okay, this thing, this thing can be modeled as a resistor. Can we also model it as a capacitor? Well, same idea. I take a look at this cell membrane, greatly exaggerated, this thin uh, seven nanometer thing. It's separating charge, right? I have more positive charge on the outside than I have on the inside. And if I flatten this thing out, I take that beach ball and I flatten it out. Um, well, it looks very much like our, our old friend, the parallel plate capacitor, which had some positive charge on this side and some negative charge on this side, separated by some distance. So it's not a perfect model, okay? This is circular, our, our model was a flat thing. And in the end, if we, if we get some number, we're gonna have to test this against data to see if it actually makes any sense at all, because it is a pretty crude model. But I think, you know, we're, we're justified to, to make this um, approximation. And as long as we test it in the end and it gives some reasonable results, we can say, oh, this is a good model. Or if it gives crap answers, then we say that was a crap model and we just move on and we, we, we try to make it more, more accurate. It's kind of the way that we work in this game. Um, so what do we have? We have the separation of charge and it's separated by some distance. I go back, this is again something that we know very well. A parallel plate capacitor, the capacitance of that capacitor um, do I have a, do I have another, do I have another, yeah, I have another demo for this, I, but I'll remind you of the formula. This is not a new formula. You've used this uh, many times, but we have the capacitance of that parallel plate capacitor is proportional to the cross-sectional area of the plates. It's inversely proportional to the distance between the plates. So the closer you get it together, the bigger the capacitance. Our old friend epsilon naught um, this awkward, very weird number that has all these crazy units, 8.9 times 10 to the minus 12 Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. Oh, well, it's a constant of nature and it, it gets our, it's, gets our units right. Um, this is a, this is a constant that has never changed as, as far as we know, the universe was born with this constant and it will end with this constant. It doesn't change. The dielectric constant, on the other hand, is something that's, a, it's, it's not a fundamental constant of nature, but it typifies the, um, the material that's in between those parallel plate capacitors, or parallel plate capacitor plates. Um, and this is, this is a, a, a constant for um, cellular membrane group, the typical number is something like nine. So the larger this number, the higher the amplification factor. And again, I remind you that uh, dielectric is just a fancy way of saying insulator. In our last example, we saw that this cellular membrane is a pretty good insulator, has a pretty high resistance. So the corresponding dielectric constant that goes along with it is gonna be pretty high. Nine is a pretty high dielectric constant. 
So if I, if, I, if I take this as my formula for capacitance, and again, I show you back our old friend, the parallel plate capacitor. If you know, we have this, you know, I can increase the, the top thing here shows me the, the value of C, and I can play with all kinds of things here. I can decrease the spacing, right? So the, the closer that is, the bigger the capacitance, the larger the cross-sectional area, the bigger the capacitance. And the last tool that I have to play with is I can stuff a dielectric in between my plates there and increase the capacitance that way. And that's what's happening with this, um, with this cellular membrane. So if I increase that dielectric constant, the capacitance increases. And remember, what, what good is the capacitance? The capacitance um, tells us that the response of these, this parallel plate capacitor to an applied voltage. So the higher the capacitance, the larger the amount of charge that you can get across this. So it's kind of a, a response factor of your system. Larger it is, the, the bigger the response. So, so, okay, we have this kind of tortured model where we've taken our cell, we've, we've split it out and, and, and laid it flat, and, and that's our model of what's going on. These, you know, the separated by the cell membrane is our, our two separation of charge, just like in a parallel plate capacitor. So I can do the same thing that I did with a resistor. I know these numbers, right? I know the dielectric constant, I just put it in. I know epsilon naught, I just put it in. I know the cross-sectional area of this cell membrane, and that's just the surface area of this little beach ball, and that's four pi r squared. And the distance between the positive charges and the negative charges to a good approximation, it's just gonna be that cell membrane thickness so we have seven nanometers. You notice here that I cheated a little bit and I left off all my units. I'm, I, I see a, com a comment in the, in the chat. I'll get that in a second, as soon as I'm done um, just saying this, what I'm saying here. Um, I left off all my units here, but I know that I put them all in an SI on this side. So if I, if I, do, my, if I do that, I'm guaranteed to get SI on the, on the left-hand side. So I know that I'm gonna get something in farads. I type in all these numbers, I get 8.9, 10 to the minus 11, and my units are farads. This is something like 90 times 10 to the negative 12 farads, or 90 picofarads. So let me see what the question is. Why does placing a dielectric between the parallel plate capacitor increase capacitance? That's, um, Francis, that's an excellent question. Um, I need about five minutes to answer that question. It's it's not too it's not too tricky, but it, it it's going to take me a couple of graphs to show that. If you will, it's an excellent question, and and right, it's kind of counterintuitive. Why does why does that increase the capacitance as opposed to decrease it? Um, if you'll bear with me, I'll show that next lecture. I um, uh, but it's a great question. Okay. Um, and, it, and I agree, it's counterintuitive. Why doesn't it go the other way? That's a, it's, 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 it, in my mind, it's like, why does it do that? It should go the other way. So let me just run out the string here. So 90 picofarads is what we get for this cell membrane. And um, again, our, our humble little cell, our humble little neuron or whatever the heck this is, this, this cell that's living in our body, some, you know, hundreds of Avogadro number of, of these things just kind of, you know, making up what we are. Each one of them just, just, you know, apparently simple. But this is what you would see if you broke open some kind of electronic device and pulled out a 90 microfarad or 90 um, picofarad uh, capacitor. It's quite a, you know, it's not the world's biggest capacitor, but it's a non-negligible capacitance and it's a useful capacitance that you would find in a typical circuit. It's not minuscule. It's actually quite, a, you know, quite a, a substantial capacitance. And again, we have this humble little cell that, you know, is creating this this large electric field. It has a sizable potential difference across it. It has a um, impressive resistance, and then finally, the the capacitance of it is going to be is is going to be this, you know, um, kind of significant number. So all together, we've painfully done this from the beginning of the class to the end here. We have this idea of an RC circuit, um, and the RC circuit 
that we're modeling is this cell and the, the cell membrane in particular. So we've got our R, that was our 32 mega ohms. We've got our capacitance, it's our 90 picofarads. And if I'm modeling this, okay, it has a resistance and it has a capacitance. This looks a lot like my RC circuit, this discharge circuit that we saw in the beginning of the class. Um, all I need to know to know the time dependence of the circuit is take that R, take the C, multiply them together. And I've got 3.2 times 10 to the seven ohms. I've got 90 times 10 to the negative 12 farads. And together I get 2.8 times 10 to the negative three seconds. Again, ohms times farads equals seconds. How do I know that? I don't, I don't remember this kind of stuff. Maybe you guys do after you see it one time. Um, I don't, but I do know that I did my, my resistance in ohms and I did my capacitance in farads. So I better get a time in seconds uh, when I'm done. SI, SI gives me SI. Anyway, all that aside, we get something that with a time constant of about three milliseconds. And again, hopefully along the way you were like, hey, Professor Slifer or whatever it is that you call me, um, this, is, this is nonsense. The, they're, they're not flat. They don't have, you know, this doesn't look anything like the, 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 the conductor that we calculated the resistance for. It doesn't look anything like the parallel plate capacitor that we, that we you know, play with in the lab. Um, you know, why should I trust anything that, that you say about this? Well, in the end, again, this is a simple model. The test of, of whether it works or not is, do you get something that's realistic? And we can actually test this. Again, my, my bio, biology background is, is pretty limited. I wish it was better. Um, but I do know that if you go into, you know, if you go into a Petri disc and you play around with cells, you can, you can apply a voltage across a cell boundary, across a cell membrane with one of these micro pipettes. And you could actually either apply a potential difference or you could actually measure a potential difference in this, in this process. Um, and if I apply a potential difference of about 10 millivolts across that cell membrane, then what I'll find experimentally is that within a few uh, milliseconds, it's going to have dropped off by, you know, by, by a substantial amount. So that the time constant that we got from our simple model here is actually quite, um, quite realistic. It's not perfect. It's, you know, it's not accurate to the 10th decimal point. And, you know, that's not what we're aiming for with this kind of simple model. But it does get us in the ballpark of what's actually happening with this very peculiar um, system, the cell membrane that has this very large electric field across it, very large resistance um, um, to the cell membrane itself, and significant amount of, um, of capacitance associated with it. So again, this will tell us, you know, the response of, of this, not when you're doing anything tricky like, like shooting sodium ions in or out by your, by your sodium ion pump or doing anything, you know, active like that. But in a typical situation where you just charge this and looked at the, the electrical behavior of this system over time, it's going to have a time constant of three, you know, three milliseconds or so. So it turns out that this model, even as simple as it is, really gives us a, a, a neat insight into what's going into these, into these um, uh, biological systems. The, the, um, let's see. And the, the one thing I wanted to mention, I don't know. Yeah, I guess. Anyway, these RC circuits pop up over and over and over again. I, I don't want to beat it into the ground, but this, you know, this comes up again and again, anytime where you have this kind of build up um, and, and let down of, of charge or, or potential, uh, it's going to be modelable in these, with these RC circuits. So I, talk, I talked a lot here. I, had, I, I took a mortgage on Francis uh, for, next, for next lecture to talk about um, capacitance. Do we have any questions about anything else here? We're, we're kind of approaching the end of the lecture. Um, any comments on, on this or questions or comments about the exam, anything at all? I am at your service. You guys want to see the other glasses that my kids gave me? 
I don't know. They keep giving me these and they keep asking me to show them to you. So if there's no questions, I'm just going to weird you out. Um, okay. Hallie, Hallie asks, do we have lecture or group work on Friday? Good question, Hallie. Um, lecture on Friday. We have lecture on Friday because we had, we had the exam on Monday. So we got one, we got a lecture on Friday. We got a lecture on Monday and then we are done for the semester. We are very close to the end. Um, there will be no more, no more group works. Okay, and a question from Francis. We don't have any more labs, right? That's, uh, I wanna say yes, but I, let, me, um, let, me, let me post an announcement because you know, uh, Dawn, Dawn has been organizing these and it's, uh, I haven't paid quite attention. I don't think there is another lab. I'm 99% sure you are right, but I'll make an announcement about that on Canvas. Um, that's some stylish eyewear right there. You, th thank you, Troy. I, you know, I don't know. I walk around, walk around Durham. There's nobody on campus, and I just try to weird out like this is part of the pandemic is what's going on here. So, anyway, I don't know where my girls got all these weird goggles, but we have a whole stack of them. Um, Catherine asks, the final is cumulative, correct? Yes, yes, Catherine, it will be cum cumulative. Um, I thought we had another lab due on Monday. Again, Cassandra, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know this off the top of my head. I'll, as soon as the lecture is done, I'll check with Dawn and we'll post a, we'll post a clarification on Canvas. Um, I, I trust that you know whether you have a lab due or not, but I'll, I'll confirm with Dawn and, and make an announcement. Um, can we have a few clicker questions in the last few lectures? Felicia, yeah, I'll try to do that, Felicia. Sure, sure. Um, yep. I will try to do that. Okay. Um, thanks for all the feedback, guys. I appreciate it. And it's a gorgeous day out. I hope you can, you know, go outside and uh, enjoy this. I am uh, hopefully going to be able to do that as well. Thanks for your attention, and we'll see you on Friday.